Our next guest is revered as one of the greatest fast bowlers and was named as one of Wisden Cricketers of the Year in 1977. And joining us this morning, all the way from London, is for its commentator, legendary cricketer, whispering death himself, Michael Holding. Good morning, Michael. Welcome to Smile Jamaica. Good morning, Delia. Just one quick correction. I, I'm not in London. It's a little bit too cold for me up there right now. <laughs> Well, who can keep track of Michael Holding as you, you, you travel all over the world um, doing cricket? It's so great to see you, Michael. Good to see you too. It's been a long time, dear. a very been, long time. It's been a long time. Um, you know, the first question my producer had was, you know, what was one of your most memorable moments? I was trying to think of one myself, but there are so many. I'm not even sure you can narrow one of them. I mean, everyone is talking about 81 when you bowl to, to, to Jeff. But tell me, what's your most memorable moment? To be honest, Daley, I, I, I like to think more about my team than, than me personally. And I'll never forget being a member of the first ever West Indies team to go to Australia and beat Australia. Mm. You know, so many West Indies teams have been down there and I'd feel to beat them in Australia. And when we went down there in 79, 80 and won that series, that was the highlight of my cricketing career, to be honest. You know, I will never forget that. We had a great time. We enjoyed winning that series. At the end of the series, we celebrated nonstop. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just a fantastic time. It really was such a fantastic time. Um, many people don't know, Michael, that you were, I think, enrolled in university to pursue computer science. And yes, that's, that's right. So, so tell me about that because, um, I mean, it couldn't have been easy for, for Sir Ralph to hear you say, boy, is cricket are going to play, you know? I, I'm not well, going to pursue this. They just, that wasn't so much my, my father, more my mother. Wow. Because <laughs> my mother being a teacher for so many years and, of course, eventually being a headmistress. Mm -hmm. She was adamant. From I was a young man, from I, before I even had any idea about playing, in the sport. She kept on saying, you have to get some sort of an education. You have to get some qualification. You have to get some piece of paper, as she would call it, behind your name, whether it's a diploma or a, or a degree or certificate, whatever. So when I went to university in 76, the end of 76, Michael Manley gave me a scholarship to go to University of the West in this new computer science. She was elated. But then, of course, Kerry Packer came along in 77. And I left the university to go and play with Kerry Packer. Because if it hadn't been for Kerry Packer, I wouldn't have played cricket as long as I did. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I never knew that. <laughs> Not many people know that. Yes. But when Pakistan toured the Caribbean in early 1977, I did not play in that series. I was at university. And that is when Clyde Lloyd called me to tell me about Kerry Packer. And of course, when they came and spoke to me in Jamaica, I signed immediately. Yeah. Yeah. The name Whispering Death. Um, listen, <laughs> it's a name a lot, of, a lot of batsmen at that time really never wanted to hear. <laughs> at any point in time, was it, was it um, overwhelming for you? Because sometimes when people give us names, they're like, oh, my God, they expect me to all the time be the Whispering Death. <laughs> or did you just embrace the idea? I mean, you had such pace, Michael. You, you, you used to run the 400 meters, yeah? I used to do everything at school on a daily, but this, this thing people talk about, I was a great athlete. No, that's not true at all. When I was at school, I used to run, I used to play football, I used to play cricket, I used to do whatever was going. Yeah. But I couldn't have represented the school, my school, Casey. As you know, the history of Casey, I couldn't represent Casey on the track. Mm -hmm. Absolutely no chance. <laughs> that you have chronicled your journeys in life, you have no holding back. Um, and I think you also had Whispering Death. Um, tell me a little bit about that writing process for you and, and just being able to, to preserve your own legacy as Michael Holding. To be honest, I, I didn't really intend to write any books. I was approached to write each book. The first one, of course, was I did with Tony Cozia, and he did most of it. I hardly contributed much to that. He sat down with me for about two hours, and then he, just, he wrote, wrote the book and said, oh, are you happy with this? The second book I was a lot more involved in. And the second book wasn't so much about my career. It was the game of cricket and what was happening 
and the periphery of the game, how the game was changing, what was influencing change, and that sort of a thing. But I've done a third one now, daily, that has absolutely nothing to do with cricket. What? Tell this me about it. It's about racism. Ah. And it's complete. It's with the publishers. It is being published in June this year. Mm -hmm. And I expect a lot of pushback from, from this book, to be honest, because a lot of people are not going to like reading it. But it's a conversation that has to be had, and people have to face facts. Those who don't like it, sorry, I ain't going to be sorry for you. But there are factual instances in this book. It's all about fact. It's all about racism. And people will have to accept that things need to change. Well, well Michael, anyone who knows you knows you've always been forthright. You're not a man to mince words. And you always speak the truth. How important is it that we face that truth? Racism has been such a big part of our sport, and not just cricket, but, but, but how important is it for us to sit down and start to accept some of the things that happen and then to move forward with a better understanding? Very, very important, Dale, and, and I'm not talk, talking about sport. That, this book has 263 pages, and I have not involved any sporting organization or talk, spoken about any sporting organization and what they need to do. There are a lot of sports people involved because a lot of people were happy for me to be interview them for the book. But this is about the society and racism, institutional racism in the society, racist people in the society, racist occurrences in the society. What the society has done to, come, to keep the narrative of white superiority and white supremacy, white supremacy going forward. Revealing a lot of good things that black people have done that have been airbrushed out of history because it contradicts the narrative of white supremacy. This is what this book is about. And our own Usain Bolt has contributed to this book. A lot of people have allowed me to interview them. Usain Bolt, Michael jo Johnson, Naomi Osaka, Thierry Henry. I could go on for quite some bit, but those names I think people can identify with quite easily. And they were interviewed for this book. And, uh, you know, as when it comes out in June, I might be persona non grata in England after this summer, but it's okay. Yes. Michael, what makes you so passionate about um, racism? I mean, people, people talk about it. People say we have to address it. But from your perspective, you're passionate enough to have interviewed sports icons, to put it on paper, to talk about it in, in places um, for people to hear. You've used your platform to, to address the issue, what makes you so passionate? What is it about your experience that makes you so passionate? Well, I can tell you first of all, it was not intentional. What took place in England last summer, I had no intentions of doing that initially, but I was approached by my boss at Sky, Brian Henderson, who after the George Floyd incident decided with a few black people on the broadcast team, and of course, lots of black people and people of color working for Sky, he decided that something needed to be done, something needed to be said. And he asked me if I would get involved, and I was absolutely ready. You know, I go all over the world, I, exp I experience racism, but what I always said and did daily was pretty much brush it off and say, they are the people that with, with the problem. I have no problem. I'll soon be going back home to Jamaica. I don't experience racism in Jamaica because that is pretty much now on the back burner since the 40s, 50s, 60s in Jamaica. There's classism in Jamaica, but I don't experience racism. So I was happy to brush it off and head back home. But now, given the opportunity to talk about it, I was not going to step back. I was not going to lay down and, and let it pass because this is something that has bugged me for decades. And I have seen and known people that have suffered tremendously because of racism. People that have lived in England, those pictures that you're showing, they have suffered from racism a great deal. And this was my opportunity to say, yes, I know about it. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to show what people show people what this is all about. So I was glad I was given that opportunity. And again, at the end of that opportunity and the end of me speaking that summer in England, I was happy to walk on, to move on. But I was approached then by one of my co-commentators who said to me, Mikey, so what next? And I said to him, what next? I have said what I have to say. The people can't get the picture from what I've got to say or what I've already said. That means they don't want to see. They don't want to understand. 
But I, he kept on badgering me, and then I got a call from Thierry Henry, who said, no, we need to talk. And then the guy who ghosted my previous book, No Holding Back, he was also badgering me to write a book. So I decided, okay, let's go. And of course, I got a great publisher, Shyman and Schuster. Schuster, people will recognize that name. Yeah. They backed me tremendously. Yeah. Sky have, have backed me. Sky continued to promote BLM. So it, it was just the right time, dearly. Yeah. The we'll perfect look forward, came Michael, together. Michael, we'll look forward to it. And we, we have to have you back um, once it's published. Listen, you have incredible accuracy when it comes to not just playing, but commentating, you just received the Pundit um, Award, and we look forward to seeing that in this next publication. It's so good to see you, my friend. Thank you, Delia. Good to see you. And I haven't forgotten that when we were doing two holdings, eyes, how much you helped me with that. So, you know, as I've told people, every journey, you get a bit of help along the way. And I have had a lot of help from so many different people throughout this journey. They're amazing. Michael Holding, always great talking to you. Sports commentator, listen, one Thank of our you, great Jamaican people, one of our great Caribbean people, um, former West Indies cricketer, global broadcaster. Great to have him. Up next, we head to the Smile Boutique to style our very own mannequin. Sakina is styling Marvin. I'm styling Clive. You don't want to miss that. We're soon come.